Yeah. Let yes. Me... Recording in progress. Okay. That's fixed. That's fixed. Uh, we're all fixed. It's nice to see you. Uh, uh, Just a quick comment, Mike. Um, uh, uh, several of us uh, were, was thinking, like, if there's anything that you want us to kind of, like, help out with technical stuff, like moderating chats or like uh, you know recording and stuff. Just just let us know. Like, I, think. I will. I mean, yeah. see, I uh, I assume that everyone that's uh, here knows more about this than I do. <laughs> so I mean, uh, I could ask anyone, and uh, I'm sure that they would have a better idea of what's going on than me. Uh, so it's very generous of you to offer, and yes, I would be very happy to uh, have some help with these things because I don't know how they work. I I signed on a little before seven because I wanted to give myself plenty of time to get this right. And then I spent a while wondering when people were going to show up and that I must have done something wrong. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but, you know, uh, we'll, we'll yeah, no, address these worry. technical things, but we can't do it right now. I do hope that some of you got a chance to look at the lecture I posted. Yes, we have. Sure. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of points I want to make about it, but what did you think of the Oristaya? Uh, it is amazing. Uh, however bad your family life may be, you can read Greek tragedy and feel a sigh of relief. Well, I haven't cannibalized anybody lately. Uh, adultery, incest, parasite, matricide, fratricide. Uh, every, one of everything gets killed in Greek tragedy. Uh, they are the ultimate in dysfunctional families. Uh, and uh, one of the things that Plato is going to conclude later on is that, well, maybe this isn't fun for the whole family. Maybe raising kids on stuff like this might not be all that great for them. So uh, there's much to be uh, to be said and uh, discussed with regard to Aeschylus and the Oristia. I think it's one of the most beautiful pieces ever written. I mean, there's a kind of majesty and dignity to it. Uh, the rhetoric is very elevated, and uh, they carry it on on the. Hot, both the highest level of abstraction, but also uh, carrying moral implications or moral assumptions to their logical conclusion. All right, and it, you know, of course, it's the, the, what they're discussing is who you should and should not kill on the basis of blood vendetta. This intrusion of reason onto simple, uh, what, what I might call the rage of Achilles. <laughs> that everybody has inside them when pushed far enough, uh, imposing order on that sort of passion uh, means uh, finding a way to uh, self-restrain. And one of the things about Greek tragedies is that the heroes always go too far. In other words, if you really want to be heroic, then you push the envelope of what human beings can do. You aspire to the position of the gods. Think about Prometheus. He runs up, steals the fire of the gods because they're not omniscient, brings it down. In some ways, he's the perfect Greek, right? One of the things I'm trying to get across here is uh, something that people, I think, don't stop and think about with sufficient care is this. Um, s things like myth and religion, the stories that bind together, because a religion is in many ways a collection of stories that people uh, speak as a sort of common language. My argument is that religions are, in fact, uh, symbolic systems. They're governed by rules and Understanding what a religion is, is understanding, taking from a palette of symbols rather than words, and then how you deploy them and under what circumstances, which is analogous to the rules of grammar, right? So things like, uh, say, Cain and Abel, well, if you know the story, you know it's not really about two imaginary guys in the beginning of the world. What it is is about... Uh, the long-term conflict between human beings, especially because the 
uh, stories that it's embedded in mean that all men are brothers because we're all drawn from the same family and we have one father who's God. So every murder is fratricide. And that means that uh, Cain and Abel gets enacted all the time. If you see what I'm saying, this is a set of symbols and it's not gibberish or meaningless. And the least interesting or the least thoughtful objection to it is that <laughs> Cain and Abel never took up space and performed biological functions. Yes, okay, it's they're not that kind of thing. But that doesn't mean that they aren't actually uh, meaningful and communicative. I mean, that line of thinking, that line of objection to myth, remember that myth doesn't mean lie. Myth means story. The story may have a meaning in it, that's not at the level of linear propositions about the world, okay? Uh, and that's what we're seeing in the Oristia. The first two tragedies are structured in a perfectly orthodox way. We have a conflict. The conflict is irreconcilable. There's no way to work this out. Sometimes people are trapped in circumstances that they did not make and that they cannot shake off, that they're going to be pushed in one direction or another. They have some degree of control, but less than they think. Right? So um, what happens in the first two tragedies, uh, Agamemnon dies because he's killed by his wife, Clytemnestra dies then and killed by her son. And then the Furies, these inchoate feminine demons of revenge, uh, this bloodlust personified, blood pollution personified. In other words, these are really archaic ideas about blood magic and stuff like that, which is what you would expect because the Furies come from the same cultural and historical stratum that the Homeric poems came from. And here I don't mean the later written versions, I mean the earlier um, archaic sung versions, because they would have been sort of chanted by a poet, right? So uh, what we have in uh, Aeschylus is a new myth. And this myth, like the old myths, is cognitive. So in other words, when we get told in this very unusual play, the Eumenides, that we're going to invite the Furies into our, into our city, but we're going to tame them with the rationality of Athena so that while our, while our motives will be properly and kind of in some gut way, some foundational way, driven by our rage at seeing bloodshed, Right, we don't want our children or our families killed. We don't want anybody killed. Um, but that will be sublimated, driven into a legal structure that allows people to make reasonable distinctions. There's no such thing as a reasonable distinction in, say, a, a, a mafia blood vendetta. You killed him, I kill you, one of them kills the other, and this can go on for a very long period of time. And it's seen in primitive cultures all over this, all over the world. Uh, uh, blood vendettas can go on for generations. Uh, so this is a very primitive notion of justice, it's not a very effective notion of justice, as Athena is going to show us in her judgment. Sometimes it's not clear what the right answer is. In other words, the uh, Athenian jury breaks six to six. Why? Well, because there is a reasonable argument to make both for and against uh, the conduct of Orestes, right? Yes, he does have a primitive obligation to slay whoever murders his father. Yet, on the other hand, there's some sort of, it's in some way an abomination or an intrinsic malum in se, evil in itself, for a child to kill his mother. Now, the problem is uh, that some situations in life, no matter how smart you are, you can't reason yourself out of. In other words, uh, 
Orestes has no good choice. All right? He will be either hounded by the guilt of not uh, responding to his father's murder, or he will be hounded for the, by the guilt for having responded to his father's murder. Sometimes there's no good way out. All right? And that's uh, a very important dimension of tragedy. All right. We weave the webs we get caught up in. Uh, gifted people are surprisingly likely to uh, outsmart themselves. And uh, pride, hubris, arrogance, the Bible says it goes before a fall. But on the other hand, the Greek tradition says, well, if you're not going to try and take the chance on going before a fall and which leads to absolute self-destruction, well, then what's heroic about you? Don't resign yourself to being a worm. Step up and become godlike. If, uh, in other words, the Greek wants to be Prometheus and the biblical believer wants to be Job. You know, one of the other angles in this that like, I found is Aegisthus. Because like, you know, Aegisthus has a responsibility to his father and his brothers. Wow. to avenge them and like i i kind of think about it from that perspective too and the way that and i i know i'm not the first person to say this but i think if you look at the libation bearers mm. and if you subtract electra and you subtract the treachery of clytemnestra you get hamlet <laughs> that's very interesting um there are a number of different interpretations that we have of the electra story she's actually an under inter, uh, an underinterpreted and and uh uh, very interesting character. Remember when I said that uh, for the first time in tragedy, we're going to start to get interesting, hum uh, interesting female characters rather than just chips that you know indicate status. Um, as in most cases in tragedy, uh, they're going to be bloody-minded and self-destructive and destructive of other people. Uh, but that's not always going to be the case. There'll be some times when we get sympathetic figures who are purely sympathetic. But if you ever have a chance to have a look at uh, Euripides' Electra, there, she's deeply, deeply twisted, which is characteristic of everybody Euripides writes about. But the play begins where um, she's at the shrine of her father, still in mourning. It's been 10 years since daddy died. And she has some serious daddy issues that you don't get in Aeschylus, which is so much more high-minded, right? You get a tremendous amount of weird neurosis for the same character. Now, let's go back from these, though. Um, let's go back to the Oresteia and the weird way that it ends. Now, somebody's supposed to die. How do you know the, the tragedy's over if nobody's dead? And the point is that this new transformation, this new legal regime, which is going to allow us to have an intellectually respectable uh, basis for our justice and also process for our justice. We're going to impose rationality and public logical structure on the inchoate furies that are within everyone's nature. So can you see how this is uh, the artistic, but also the legal and political fallout of pre-Socratic physics. You can't sell people on blood vendetta demanded by the Furies in an age when the sun is a hot rock, because that means that you're just angry. There aren't any Furies to placate. And so if you don't feel guilty about it, there's nothing that's going to happen to you because the Furies are make-believe. It's not that rage or emotion isn't make-believe, but he says none of that has any supernatural qualities. And there are ways of dealing with the people that bear these feelings. Uh, but, and, you know, we'll teach you the, the art and science of political power. But think about how this works. This is an affirmative uh, introduction and justification for the rule of law. In ancient Athens, this gets put to put up in five uh, in 458 BC, and uh, strangely, this play the 
the, the kindly ones, which means that now we've domesticated the wild animals of the, uh, the Furies. The kindly ones are going to join us in something like a 4th of July patriotic parade, which is no way for a, for a tragedy to end, if you think about it. Because instead of confronting death and human limitation, what we're getting here is a celebration of how smart we are in getting beyond killing each other the way we did in the first two plays. Hmm. So what Aeschylus is saying is, let's let's walk up in a procession. Remember that politics and religion and art are all mixed together here. This is a religious celebration, the Dionysia, but they're celebrating it by having these guys write tragedies and have competitions for them. And it's the combination of politics religion and art that you can see kind of integrate in Periclean Athens. And what integrates them is the fact that they need to, to cash in their earlier assumptions about the world, because now they're living in a world where the sun is no longer Apollo's golden chariot. Now it's a hot rock, which means the Furies are a cute story. Aeschylus is pointing out they're more than a cute story. They're a symbol, a representation of human rage, particularly the impulse towards revenge. And this is deep. I mean, uh, my guess is, I don't know, but I might be tempted to say this is probably way back in kind of the alligator part of our brain back there. I mean, uh, you do that to me and I immediately get aggressive and get enraged. Uh, it's not one of our most uh, complex or impressive of uh, emotions, but it gets the job done if you look at a guy like Achilles. The point is this, in a civilization, as opposed to a collection of Vikings, um, rage and blood vendetta is grossly dysfunctional. You can't have people walking through town stabbing each other on account of who their cousin is. Right? That, that won't do. What are we going to do? We're going to have a government by law how are we going to justify the law? Well, law at this time, like all of politics, is legitimated on the basis of divine sanction. And that the goddess Athena in particular, since she's the patron goddess of the city, approves of this, that she's the goddess of wisdom. She really likes it. And what that does is means that we've, uh, we've shifted gears like we did with pre-Socratic physics a century earlier. We're introducing a new set of assumptions about the world, and we're reconstructing art. Remember that uh, Homeric epic is, a, is an oral tradition, and it's about big, tough guys killing things. Right? There are lots of ways to get impaled in the Iliad. Um, tragedy, on the other hand, is a written form. It is digested by a group by the Athenians, uh, as a spectacle, you know, it was performed, but it's written down first. So it has a textual structure that's fixed before it gets uh, produced. And this allows for the kind of comparison between these texts that Aristotle does in the Poetics, right? Uh, he, it's, it's like what he does with constitutions in the Politics, Right. Uh, it's harder to do with oral traditions, which is why uh, written uh, tragedy is a big change, uh, not just in the way in which uh, heroes are represented, but the uh, the implications for the audience, because there's a, ha there's a small chunk of the audience that is literate. And they will know the author and they'll be part of this literary movement. And they'll be, uh, most of the elite of Athens know each other. The other vast majority, what you would call the citizens, but poor citizens, un uninfluential citizens, that all they see is a spectacle, right? And so the spectacle they see can be really gruesome and bloody. But we don't get that in this one tragedy. We have about 28 surviving tragedies from the three great tragedians, and none of them ends like this. What I'm trying to suggest here, then, is two things. One, a religious myth is cognitive, and it's also ineliminable. Uh, in other words, I think 
that the claim that people sometimes make now of living without myths is a bluff. I think nobody does because nobody can. We all, of necessity, tell stories about the world. Um, and we tell the story which seems to us to, to make the most sense of, of the world and of ourselves. But I don't think there's going to be a time when we don't describe uh, the world and our experience of it in terms of a story. Um, if you think about what Aristotle says about tragedy, every one of them has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Well, that's also true of human life. Human life is a story. We organize our experience of the world, the experience of being you and you and you, as uh, one continuous story. So uh, stories are cognitive. Yeah, and I, I like stories. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get off topic, but when I think about myth and when I think about stories, like I go to Jean-Francois Léotard. Now, I was born in 1979, the same year that book came out. And when I went back, when I when I read that 20 years later, when I got to college, and he's talking about the narratives are dead and we don't need them anymore. And the thing that like stuck out in my head was then how do you teach people about the world they're living in? I don't know of any other way to do it except through myth and narrative. Well, my point would be that uh, the claim that narratives are dead is a meta narrative. In other words, what he's done is, this is a little bit like the logical uh, analog of those uh, toys that kids play with, you know, those finger traps where you put it in, and the harder you pull it out, the more trapped you are. Well, the more you try and make uh, inconvenient elements in reality go away, like, well, he's skeptical of meta narratives, but that itself is a stance towards being no less or more or more uh, improbable and uncertain than the opposite statement, providing, of course, that he's true. So I'm not interested in walking some logical Mobius dip with uh, Leotard or any of the Pomo guys. Uh, I, I got tired of self-referentiality and being cute a long time ago. One of the things that, you know, I mean, one of the things that uh, set me off and made me think in a, a new way about politics is that uh, when I was a graduate student, I taught for a while at City College, and uh, I, you know, I was supervised by the chairman of the department, as they do with all graduate students that are teaching there. And uh, I asked her after we, we got along nicely, and I asked her about some of the unusual claims being made because the uh, the distortions in the history were wild and, of course, bizarre. I mean, this is what we're seeing now is not new. And she told me, look, essentially, there's no such thing as true and false. There's only, are you, whose side do you want? Uh, oppressed peoples use history necessarily, deploying uh, stories, all of which are equally false and true. Now, this is real cute. And I thought it was okay because uh, she was a, she was a kind of a weird and funny Slavic historian. She was a, a big kind of big shouldered, butchy, a uh, uh, lesbian who had been all through the world. She was very worldly and knew diplomacy. But here's what worries me, okay? Uh, I walked back to the office and I was deeply concerned because this is the ideology of Joseph Goebbels. I mean, don't tell me that this is progressive. Good Lord. Oh, I'm coming to this, my ma'am. Yes, your email. That's right. She was Milosevic's friend. The next time I saw her it was the late 90s. I was teaching at Princeton then. I was making dinner. I turned the TV on, and there she was. And she was speaking in italics, the way she had spoken to me when she said that nothing was real and nothing was true, which is actually just ancient Greek philosophy warmed up and reheated. Um, but there she was, and she had taken a, uh, a leave from City College, went back to Serbia, where she come from, and she was now the Serbian Minister of Information. So our sensitive, uh, uh, how can I put it, progressive professor had had no problem flipping into a genocidal Nietzsche and Uberfra. There she was explaining that there wasn't any massacre at Srebrenica and that the rape hotels where the 
local women were impregnated. None of that happened either. And even if it did happen, it was unavoidable given the evils had been perpetrated. But fortunately for us, it never happened. And we can talk about the Chinese embassy. And this is the improper interference in the internal affairs of a sovereign country. And besides, none of this ever happened. Hmm. My point is this nihilism, uh, which is allegedly left wing, is actually just <laughs> nihilism. It's not left wing or right wing. It's just seeking power. And uh, this is a Foucauldian choice. Um, she's dead now, but my best understanding is that she was essentially an unindicted war criminal, right? The guy she worked for ended up going to The Hague. Now, I think there's a relationship between persuading yourself that there's no truth and no reality and coming up with bogus stories instead of history and lying to the media to justify atrocities. And uh, I have really no patience for it. Um, you know, uh, uh, I am not convinced that there is any longer a distinction between right and left. There's only those who seek justice of one kind or another, right? That's something that I think I have in common with my friend Cornell West, brother Cornell. I have in common with, with Noam Chomsky. Look, I have a lot of problems with him, but I agree with him that what we're trying to get is justice. There's another view that we see in somebody like Foucault and also in the, in her name was Radmila Milantevich. Uh, she was willing to pursue power instead of justice. Yeah, I'll examine life. Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to unmute you. What do I do? Oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'll unmute myself. Okay. That's okay. Thanks. So, yeah, yeah, I used to work for the Serbian Minister of Information. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was just like uh, just just reflecting uh, uh, the point of what you guys talking about uh, with what's going on, obviously in um, um, Israel and Palestine. Um, Don't take me there. Let's not take it there. It's not You're right to say about it. It's just that I have nothing to say about it here and now. Okay. Sure. Sure. I am gonna have things to say. Don't misunderstand me. But not now. Not this. Right. Mm -hmm. of reasons and it's not it's not a moral cowardice it's just that uh i don't want to get sidetracked into that whirlpool when i'm trying to teach something about uh the nature of symbolic systems in a way what i'm saying is something like this the big picture when you read the oristia and you understand the historical background you can see that something new is happening here right this is not like the iliad it is very clear that human beings have agency and we're going to hold them responsible. I doubt very much that the Furies chase cows around. I doubt very much that the Furies threaten misery and torture to bodies of water. Can you see how the world has changed here? Nobody has any doubt as to who and what counts as a moral agent. Okay. In order, and now that we have that conception of individual moral agents, now uh, external political law is going to make a lot more sense, right? Uh, it used to be that we used to prosecute uh, killers. Now we just prosecute human beings that kill other human beings rather than statues. <laughs> We're living in a new world. And what he's trying to give us is a myth which is cognitive, which tells people that the god, patron goddess of our city, the goddess of wisdom, endorses this new regime. And we will uh, climb in a kind of procession, which is as religious as it is political. Imagine uh, a kind of religious procession uh, on the 4th of July. We'll give you some idea. They go into the Areopagus, which is the highest point in the city. It's the place where the high court, the one that only is allowed to address murder cases, is located. So we're going to bring the whole menagerie, including the Furies, up there, and we're all going to party, which is not, which is I mean, the most unorthodox possible uh, tragedy. And so it begs the question of why he's doing that. And he's doing it because he's not so much interested in maintaining the form and structure, although he, Clearly, from the first two plays, he knows how to do that. What he's saying is, look, um, 
the, the great poet Shelley once said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And that's not only true of poets, it's also true of musicians. Once uh, music makes its way into your head, the musician and the song owns you. It's true. I mean, if I have an earworm, who's in charge? You were the worm. <laughs> all right. Well, that's going on all the time. But here, what he's doing is saying, this is life as a conclusion, not death as a conclusion, because this tragedy does not go too far. We did not let the Furies enact their revenge when we know better how to dispense justice. So what we're doing here is creating a new intellectually respectable kind of dramatic art. We're combining it with a new intellectually respectable account of the rule of law. We're justifying the legitimacy of the regime with reference to religious myths that are expressed in artistic form. Uh, in other words, what he's doing there is what uh, Michelangelo did on the ceiling of the Sistine. Those daubs of paint up there, they mean something. In other words, uh, they didn't get Jackson Pollock to do the Sistine, and there's a reason why, okay? Because you're not looking at meaningless splotches. What you're looking at is symbols. These represent things. So my point then, you could represent it in visual form, or in audible form, and the audible form might be musical, or it might be uh, uh, writ uh, spoken, and later on it might be written. But the point is that uh, each of these forms brings together art, politics, and religion. And these things don't get separated. In some ways, they don't get, ever get fully separated. But uh, they don't get, we don't get an idea like the separation of church and state until the Enlightenment. We're still a long way from that, all right? And it, it, the reason why is because every ancient society everywhere in the world justifies its politics with reference to its religion. The gods, whoever they are, usually there's one for the sun and one for the moon and one for the ocean and, you know, what, however many you happen to need. And... Uh, the if if you, people ask why do we have to obey the king or the priests, the answer is because the gods really like them, and if you don't, we're going to kill you. And if you ask, well, why are you going to kill me? He said, well, we want to make sure the gods know that it's you that don't like them, not us, because we don't talk back to the gods. That's why there's no such thing as uh, individual rights or right to dissent in the ancient world. Uh, you don't have a right to dissent against God. Once we get to human bottom up political legitimacy. You have a every right to argue against people who are just as human as you are and just as fallible. So now, think about what we're getting here and what I'm going to show you next month. From here, uh, well, here we can see, first of all, religion is cognitive. They're telling the people something. So is art. So is the new regime of law. All of them can best be understood as a response to the fact that the old stuff doesn't run anymore. We have a new operating system, and now we're changing out sequentially the applications that run on it. Okay? Um, next month, what we're going to do <clears throat> is examine the very optimistic idea that human beings are rational animals. And I've chosen Euripides Bacchae. Now, if you know that play, uh, <laughs> I think the best we can say is that human beings are potentially rational animals, which is different from being rational, actually. And the second part, and which elaborates the argument I've been making today, will be Thucydides' Peloponnesian War. And the reason why I... Uh, uh, want to do that is because uh, Thucydides creates the first genuinely empirical history. In other words, this is the social science analog <clears throat> of pre-Socratic physics. He says, look, Herodotus and all the other historians, all the other poets have been telling you a lot of malarkey. Forget it. It's all wrong. They made that stuff up. 
You know, like at the beginning of the Iliad, when uh, uh, an epidemic breaks out because Apollo was offended. Well, here's the score. There's no such thing. You didn't get offended and all that stuff is wrong. He said, I lived through a, a, a plague in Athens. I actually got the plague. It was really bad. Uh, some people survived. Some people didn't. Some of the survivors did all kinds of religious stuff. Some didn't do anything at all. Lots of the people who died did all kinds of religious stuff, and some didn't do anything at all. There's no connection whatever to the gods and the supernatural with regard to epidemics. And the worst thing you can do is delude yourself into believing that this has supernatural causes. Can you see how this is pre-Socratic physics applied to the human world? You should see the really nasty things he has to say about uh, generals that are interested in omens. <laughs> He's not enthusiastic about omens. He said, count the size, the size of your army. Forget the omens, save that. Um, he's the guy who gives us the idea of realpolitik. Nowadays, uh, if you take a graduate degree in international relations, uh, probably the first reading you'll do the first September you start will be the section from Thucydides <clears throat> called the Dialogue at Milos. And that's where uh, the Melians break away from the uh, Athenian protection racket. They got a big navy. So they come in and they say, look, you either give up right now, we're going to slaughter everybody. And they said, well, couldn't we be friends? And the Athenians say, no, we have a big army and you have a small army. That's not possible. Uh, instead of friendship, you're going to do what you must and we're going to do what we can because the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. And this is justice. Are you like me now? Um, if you know the first book of Plato's Republic, you'll realize that what they're saying is that justice is the advantage of the stronger, which is them. So you may wonder where this stuff comes from. Uh, Thucydides was educated by sophists, which is why he has learned the art of rhetoric, which is why he doesn't actually need to be present for any of the speeches that get given because everybody else was educated by the same sophist. They drop all the stuff into the same rhetorical forms. So he knows who wins the argument and he knows who has the, the what the uh, content of it has to be. And he can put it together and reconstruct it with surprising degree of accuracy, far greater than we could now because of the heterogeneity of our speech. Um, Thucydides also shows how fragile and even essent political order is, how much easier it is to destroy it than it is to uh, construct it. And he shows in the case of Corsaira uh, how the rich and the poor go at each other and bring in their proxies, uh, or they're the proxies for Athens and, and uh, Sparta, and each side slaughters the other when they get the opportunity, and then they go away, and then the other side gets slaughtered. Eventually, they have almost nobody left, and the oligarchs, the rich guys, are stuck. So uh, they find that the only way to save themselves and save the city is to burn it. And then everybody ends up dead because there's no city and there aren't any, any, any uh, corsarans anymore. Yeah. The problem is, I mean, I, <clears throat> I've talked about this with politicians and, you know, most of them, they're practical politicians. They look, you know, human nature hasn't changed all that much. There is a tendency towards centrifugal forces taking over things that hold society together. The centrifugal forces are very fragile and hard to maintain. And once they disequilibrate, uh, the danger is that the disequilibrium becomes complete and it collapses. So uh, it's a very interesting study in civil war, but it's also a very interesting study in uh, the result, in the consequence or the outcome of failing to appreciate what you have. All right. Think about it this way. Freud wrote a very powerful, interesting little essay called Civilization and Its Discontents. And it turns out that if you're civilized, 
you have to be discontented because you can't engage in aggression and sex whenever and however you want, which would be a lot of fun. And that's the uh, gratification of your libido, absolutely. Um, restraint on that is painful. And that's why you have to be discontented or why you have reason to be discontented. I would send the, the, the person that read that, I would have them read Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. Yeah. Um, that's, about, <laughs> that's about the fragility and evanescence of justice and political order. And if you think that civilization gives you grounds for content, for discontent, wait and you see what the lack of civilization looks like uh, when people are entirely unregulated in their aggression and sex and uh, uh, general, uh, uh, generally terrifying uh, qualities, which are the ones that society, that civilization is going to have to restrain and break down. Examined life, go ahead. Who is examined life? Yes, that's me, Eduardo. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. Um, so are you essentially, I'm just trying, I think you kind of answered my question ju just earlier. Are uh, you essentially trying to say that while well, the real politic, um, and like the all against all kind of like a situation is probably not the best for like society, and it might be better off to have uh kind of like a platonic way of uh um organizing society, uh, with the justice that how you know Plato puts it. Is that kind of like what you would say? Uh, well, no. Okay, here's is what I um I think that uh that the Frankfurt School, I think it's Platonism gone mad. In other words, I think what these guys have done is promote themselves to philosoph to philosophers, and then on that basis made the claim that they should be kings. The idea is something like that. Let me show you what I mean. Um these Marxist Freudians, which is what the Frankfurt School is, think about somebody like Marcuse, one dimensional man or Eros in society. We are, our Eros is repressed. Why? Because of the constraints imposed by capitalism and uh, uh, historical traditions. So we need to uh, create uh, an ongoing critique of everything existing. This is picked up from Marx and liberate eros and desire because that's what will make our, us happy you can see the freud here okay here's the question he marcusa very clearly believes that he understands the true nature of human happiness and human felicity and if you disagree with him you are wrong it turns out that the satisfaction of your desires is what makes people really happy freud also believed that now well, my question is, is are you sure of that? Um, there are actually a great many satisfactions in human life. Are you sure that the satisfaction of your libido um, is the highest existence for human beings? This sounds to me suspiciously like the beginning of the second book of the Republic, where we're talking about the man who gets all his desires gratified through indifference to justice. Okay, I'm not sure that they get that right. I'm not sure that that's human felicity. I don't think it is, actually. And for that reason, um, when I deal with both uh, with the Frankfurt schoolers, I ask them, well, do you have special philosophical knowledge which, in, which discloses to you um, the ultimate nature of moral reality? Now, that's a pretty straightforward, that's a straightforward yes or no question. None of them will give you a yes or no, because the answer is yes. They do think that they have, understand the real nature of human felicity. They understand thus the real nature of the political impediments to it. And thus they have a program and a way of teaching which will enable the realization of that ideal. Now, there are so many problems with this exercise in self-deception with this colossal egoism, uh, with this bombastic German Mandarin crap, I almost don't know where to start, but actually there are a couple that suggest themselves. Hypothetically speaking, 
if a philosopher king or a philosopher who is suited to be king in the platonic sense were to come up and shake me by the hand and, and introduce himself, how do you do? I'm a philosopher. I should be king. Um, I'd ask him why. And he says, well, because I know the ultimate nature of reality and I have superior powers of moral discernment. And I would say, that's great. And these superior powers are going to be very different from my own. And well, yes, of course, I'm a philosopher. I said, well, how... Not be, my, me not being a philosopher, how am I supposed to be able to distinguish between your true, wonderful platonic knowledge and somebody who's just batshit crazy? Um, in other words, you might also tell me that you have superior knowledge and it indicates that you're Napoleon. It doesn't seem to me that I have good reason to, uh, to accept that at face value. This is a very German idea because so much of German philosophy is uh, an aspiration towards omniscience, but it's a bluff. <laughs> These guys aren't any more omniscient than anybody else. This is what the Anglo-American tradition is good at, sticking pins in continental balloons, and there's no no more vacant balloon than the, the Frankfurt School. Well, well, maybe, I mean, Leotard, Foucault, there's a number that I could put in there. But my point is this. Um, these giant uh, skeptical anti-systems are uh, not new. In fact, they harken back to the earliest stages of Greek philosophy, and we're still dealing with the same problems. If you want to see what postmodernism looks like, have a look at the end of uh, the Gorgias by Plato. Look at the speech of Callicles. He's a power-mad guy. He could be Foucault's second cousin. All right. So my point, my big point is this, I'm trying to persuade you that art should be taken seriously and as cognitive, in, uh, so, as a cognitive source for historical generalizations. And not just literary art, also visual art. Also, if you think of something like, uh, even dance can do that. A uh, ballet is clearly a system of symbols. And if you think of the ballet that Nijinsky had wrote to accompany the Rite of Spring, well, it's very clearly that those gestures are telling you a story, right? So art can is cognitive and it's also communicative. And it's not communicative necessarily in the way that, that uh, natural language is, but it's certainly a kind of communication. Music would be the best example of that. Uh, you don't have to be a musical genius to know the difference between a funeral dirge and a wedding march. Nobody wants to waltz to a funeral dirge, right? You, what's being communicated to you is sadness and regret. So my point then is this. Don't get stuck on the idea that physics is our only, or physics and math, are our only models for knowing things. Um, that is reductive in a, in, a think, in a sense that I think is mistaken. Think of your mind as being not just a, a one kind of fixed blade. Think of your mind as being something like a Swiss army knife. You have lots of ways of thinking, right? What you want to be able to do with the different kinds of cognition is to... Uh, make sure that all of them work at a decent level because the hypertrophy of some leading to the neglect of others will make you a real geek, <laughs> right? So um, extend your appreciation for different kinds of symbolic systems. Think about something like uh, 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 the, the statue in Hindu, in, in Hindu temples of Shiva, Right? She's got four arms, four legs. Now, this is not anything silly about extra arms and legs. What we have there instead of four is two to the is two squared, more, more, in other words, more arms than we do at another level, another dimension. And it's not really two squared, it's two to the n. So Shiva turns out has two to the n <laughs> arms, and she also has two to the n legs. And what those things do is the arms do all the creation of everything that comes into being in the universe. And she pushes the ground, every, all the stuff that goes into motion. And then when the set, same stuff stops being in motion and stops, that's when she steps on it with her two to the end feet. And when things are destroyed, that's how they get destroyed. So in other words, if you look at it, looking for what 
they're trying to communicate to you here. Um, what you have to do is uh, try not to be so linear because that's not the only thing, a way of explaining things or of understanding things, right? Arithmetic is one of my favorite things, but it's not everything there is to know, right? Mm -hmm. uh, myth then is cognitive. So is art. It's a, it's a system of symbols deployed within uh, certain parameters, which function as a kind of grammar. And this grammar tells us how to interpret the set of symbols we got. So, yeah, good. All right. Um, a friend of mine who's a doctor once told me that pain is his friend. And I said, that's very strange. How could pain be a doctor's friend? He said, look, the thing that scares me is not pain. It's numbness. All right. Because if a patient comes in and says they're numb, I don't know what I'm looking for, what I'm trying to fix. If a patient comes in with a particular pain, shows me where it is, I can figure out what's going wrong there. Okay. So, uh, the opposite of the insight that you get from great works, uh, both of art and of religion and of philosophy. Of any, there, there are many way, ways to realize to true greatness. If you get a chance, look at a movie called The Alpinist. But back to this, um, there are many ways to achieve greatness, but the opposite of greatness and the opposite of the insight that you get from great art, a great philosophy, great literature, a great religion too, great religious texts. Um, problem is that sometimes they're going to hurt you because they're painful because they force self-examination. But what they don't do is make you numb. TikTok or running through, you know, all, all the videos of cats playing the piano what that do? What that is is software <laughs> anesthesia. In other words, these are people that want. I mean, if you know the Pink Floyd song, they want to be comfortably numb. They want to sit there and absorb this. And uh, I mean, the most, in some ways, dangerous because it's the most addictive. I would guess is addiction to pornography, because it, particularly with men, men's a visual cortex is connected to uh, is connected in such a way that we respond to visual images in a way that women generally don't. And uh, pornography, seeing this increasingly weird stuff where you get to the point where nothing can be more bizarre than, uh, you know, what people are consuming. Um, what that is, is that they need a higher and higher rate because they're running on the hedonistic, the hedonic treadmill. Once you're on that, you got to keep running and nobody can keep up with it. And so, uh, yeah, uh, people who are seeking numbness are in pain. And the true answer to their pain is to face it and then turn it into something else. Right. That's why uh, anesthesia and uh, synthetic opioids, because I have cancer, I know about them. Uh, they have their place, but they're really dangerous. And if you can stay away from them, you should, right? You'll be better off if you leave it alone. So uh, um, that's what I would say about the internet. Uh, it's a it's a good servant and a bad master. Find your time to do some things with real human beings. All right, go outside. 
Uh, there are a lot of things you can do to cure this uh, this curious numbness, but it helps to know that that's what you're seeking with this, you know, three seconds of who knows what bungee jumping and then uh, three seconds of uh, God only knows what cats chasing mice, mice chasing cats, uh, explosions, uh, testing of guns. I mean, God only knows what's going on there. But uh, the fact that it doesn't cohere leaves your mind a jumble. I mean, how would you ever piece together what that was and what that might mean? Doesn't mean anything, right? Now, I love Jackson Pollock, but I love Jackson Pollock. I could sit at, at MoMA for 45 minutes or an hour just looking at one of those big things because it really, it agitates you. Uh, someone once called uh, Jackson Pollock's paintings uh, energy made visible, which is actually not a bad way of thinking about it because it looks like you're in one of those uh, cloud jars where they're doing uh, subatomic physics. And uh, Coltrane was once described as uh, energy made audible. And if you look, if you listen and look, <laughs> the similarity is quite surprising. So um, what I've been trying to, to, to get across to people is that there are multiple overlapping symbolic systems that we run all the time. These are generally speaking, the legacy systems from 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, they still operate all the time. Uh, I mean, I know that we're all scientific and we, we here we are on the internet, we're living in the digital world, but the uh, ships that bring these laptops to us from the other side of the world, all of them had to go through a process called christening because otherwise the ship has bad luck. It has to have a bottle broken on it. Now, this is... A, certainly 2,000 years old, the idea that you have to give a libation to the gods of the sea in order to assure good luck for a ship, but people still doing it and trying. I mean, there are many captains who say, look, I won't do it. I won't get on the new ship until we break some sort of bottle. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, I'm not superstitious, but we're breaking the bottle, all right? So uh, the point is, all of these things, these different operating systems are running in our minds simultaneously. OK, they overlap. And. Uh, well, that I'll leave you with that to think about for now. Next week, though, or next month, what we're going to look at is Thucydides and Euripides. Euripides for me is a guilty pleasure. I have often taken shots at Euripides because he seemed to me sometimes kind of morally frivolous, but I've sort of grown into him as I've become more perverse and gotten older. Uh, <laughs> If you wanted to know what Euripides is like, and you want to read a couple more things, uh, he's the ancient world analog of Quentin Tarantino. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, you, uh, was that really necessary? And the answer is yes. <laughs> right. So, yeah, he's going to be completely outrageous and completely over the top. And that's what's going to be so much fun about the Bach. All right. I'm now. I'm now imagining the end of the Bach guy as if it were Kill Bill and Pentheus and his <laughs> limbs. It's actually not so far. Right? <laughs> Pentheus thinks he's rational. <laughs> Dionysus thinks not. <laughs> so, can, can I ask you one quick question about your opinion? Yeah. Just because just, we talked about the Bach guy. Um, when I first read the Bach guy the, and, and Dionysus gets arrested and Pentheus is interrogating him, it seems awfully similar to Caiaphas interrogating Christ. Mm. He's asking him all the same questions. The difference is it's the wrath of Christ rather than the death. I hadn't actually thought of that. I'm not really sure. Uh, uh I'd actually have to go back and look at the dialogue. But the thing with uh, Dionysus is that he maintains this worldly power. In other words, you don't push Dionysus around. He's not going to be killed by mere, mere humans. Instead, you'll notice that every time he gets bound up, he immediately loses his bounds. Every time he gets put in a cell, the cell immediately magically opens without any effort on his part. In other words, what that means, again, this is a system of symbols, is that nobody successfully keeps Dionysus tied up. 
the best you can hope to do is what the old men do. He said, look, we know he looks stupid dancing in the way Dionysus wants, but wait and you see what not dancing the way Dionysus wants looks like, and you'll be dancing too. Pentheus says, no, I'm rational. I'm a tough guy. He turns out that he's a, a hidden transvestite. He goes dressed as a woman uh, to the Bacchanal and then gets torn apart and eaten by the main ads and his mother brings back his head as a trophy this is once again as plato will point out fun for the whole family <laughs> this is what you really want the kids to be raised on <laughs> be good or i'll have some or have your grandmother bring your head home from the bacchanal so uh i'm trying yeah. to make room for the cognitive status of literature and religion and uh the soft sciences no, very few people like physics as much as me because I organize my history of the world around it. But that doesn't mean that other ways of thinking aren't worthwhile. Um, I'm pragmatic. It depends on what you're trying to do. Think of it this way, all right? And I'll let you go with this. You might ask, is a satellite photo of Florida while it's having a hurricane, uh, is it a good photo? And I would say, well, it doesn't show your backyard, but it does show the hurricane. Whether it's a good photo depends on whether you're selling real estate or forecasting weather. It is, as Aristotle says, it's the march, mark of an educated man not to demand more precision from a discipline than it could possibly offer. These cognitive stories I'm talking to you about, they don't have the degree of precision that the exact sciences do. My point is, so what? <laughs> hmm. That's not the only kind of of thinking we can do. Well, I was going to say, like, I'm a, I'm a physicist, and uh, my job <laughs> is like to be precise. Uh, and now I'm an engineer designing, like, you know, technologies and stuff. And uh, I mean, like, just going back to like, you know, the arts and so forth. I'm just trying to learn more of the arts and taking upon some of the lessons uh, that you're trying to make about, you know. Uh, using that part of the, the right side of the brain uh, uh, or a holistic point of view in terms and applying it to uh, a lot of the things that I do, including my job. Um, and go, going, swinging to the left uh, hemisphere, like the logical paradoxes sometimes that rises up, I see that could be a problem. And like, you know, we using like uh, increasingly more analytical view uh, for a lot of the things, um, I mean, could be a problem. Like when it comes to my job, and try, sometimes I'm trying to explain it to my colleagues as to like, well, there's no point going so precise when our design doesn't requires it. And it also talks about, uh, you know, the kind of an, uh, analysis that you're looking for uh, and like, you know, the results that you're trying to achieve. So I guess it's kind of like the kind of golden mean that you're trying to look for. Uh, you know, what is necessary required and the, the kind of precision that we need to make. Um, I'm just trying to see, like, you know, is that kind of like what you're trying to say? In that well, sense? that's part of it. That's part of it. In other words, um, it's it's a mistake for carpenters to, to to look for the same degree of precision that wafer, that wafer fabrication manufacturers do. Right. If they're manufacturing microprocessors, they have to get down to the angstrom and they need clean rooms and all that stuff. You don't have to get down to the angstrom if you're building a house. If you're within uh, a few millimeters, you're good. Nail it together. So, um, first of all, it's a pragmatic dimension to knowledge. Right. Um, not everything needs absolute precision and not everything offers absolute precision. OK, it's really not the end of the world. Sometimes you get fuzzy areas, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't mark out a domain, right? Think of, uh, say, uh, the question of when we can give people driver's licenses. Um, it'll be something between 16 and 18, something around there, late teens. Uh, different places for different reasons with different circumstances might come up with different numbers, but any place within there is roughly uh, reasonable. But if someone were to say, I want to give driver's licenses to people that are three, we can, with good reason, say, well, that's just too young. That's not reasonable. It doesn't mean that there has to be a one unique, precise answer for us to make that claim. 
Same sort of thing with the people that are really concerned about traffic accidents. So they're not going to let anybody who's under 70 years old drive. Right. So all these old folks can drive around. The rest of us can walk because uh, it will no doubt decrease the number of traffic accidents. But the point is the trade off isn't reasonable. Hmm. Right. So despite the fact that the age at which we give driver's licenses is not one fixed point, 17 years, eight months, nine days, three seconds. It doesn't work that way. You don't need it to work that way. That doesn't preclude the possibility that some things are not reasonable, despite the fact that reason isn't exact here. And everybody knows it. I mean, there's nobody who thinks that three and and 70 are okay. All right. Um, I'll let you go with this. Science is, uh, and all of the, the wonderful constructions we get from ancient Greece thing you should keep in mind is this and you should particularly keep it in mind if you're a smart guy like you certainly appeal to be um every insight is partial blindness you lose sight of that and you're about to become a greek hero (laughs) you're about to become tragic it's when you decide that oh i got it all wrapped up you're cooked uh every insight is partial blindness the smarter you are the more you need to remind yourself of this stupid people don't tell themselves that smart people tell themselves that and they get themselves in incredible problems you think you got it all sewed up no you got it all together no you finally understand it no You've made an advance. You're doing better than you were. You traded in your old problems for a new set of problems you like better. But every insight is partial blindness. It's the things, it's it's not the things you don't know that are going to kill you. It's the things you're certain of. (laughs) All right. You're only as good as your presuppositions. Good night, my friends. All right. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Recording.